Welcome to Full Prefrontal, the show that exposes the mysteries of executive function. This podcast is a collection of conversations about the role of the prefrontal cortex, which impacts your focus, planning, problem solving, emotional balance, and independence. So join us as we explore executive function and the science of learning. And now, here's your host, the founder of EXQ, Sucheta Kamath. back to Full Prefrontal, where we expose the mysteries of executive function. I am your host, Sucheta Kamath. You will notice several changes. First of all, we have had a makeover. Uh, Check out our new logo. Secondly, I'm also going at it alone. You will notice that we don't have producer Todd here. I will miss him terribly, but he has coached me well, so I feel very confident. And lastly, if you have uh, um, you haven't done this already, be sure to follow us on our social media as well as share this uh, podcast with your friends uh, and subscribe to us. Um, now, it's a great pleasure to uh, welcome our guest today. One of the things that we talk about here is executive function, in essence, a set of mental skills that allow us to manage our thoughts, feelings, attitudes, mindsets, and actions. But we cannot be productive, successful without talking about role of emotions. And uh, our guest today has all the expertise in the world to not only understand the role of emotions, but how to successfully manage. So I'm very curious to frame this from that point of view. So it gives me a great pleasure and honor to welcome Dr. David Burns. He is an adjunct clinical professor emeritus at Stanford University, Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Science. He has many, many accomplishments uh, under his belt, but uh, I'll mention a few. One of the favorite things of mine is um, I think he published his first book in uh, 1989. No, 1890. I'm actually 153 years old. (laughs) (laughs) I was just about to say that I got a hold of it in uh, 1999. So I was a little bit uh, slow to start, but I caught up. That has been my personal uh, playbook in managing my emotions as a clinician. You know, as a speech and language pathologist, we don't get any training in counseling, but it's counseling is an essential aspect of managing patients' needs and families. Uh, secondly, I will say he's a highly published um, uh, uh, researcher, and he Uh, also has uh, a very, very successful uh, podcast. And if you haven't heard, I I was just uh, telling him that I have heard only 143 podcasts so far, but I think he has crossed over 185. So it's called Feeling Good Podcast. All this will be in your show notes. So please uh, read that and follow up. And finally, the most amazing thing I'm waiting, I've ordered it, but he has a new book coming out called Feeling Great. And I'm hoping that um, he will give us the 2.0 version of uh, Dr. Burns' wisdom. So welcome to the podcast. Thanks for having me on. It's a great, an honor and a great pleasure. Thanks. Thank you. So uh, I asked this of all my guests. So my first question to you is, since we talk about executive function, the adaptive flexibility, goal management, intentional focus, I like to ask my uh, guests, what was, what were you like as a child? How were your executive function skills? And when did you become, since you specialize in emotions and emotional management, when did you become aware of your own emotional sense of being an emotional person, a person with emotions? Well, those are pretty big words for me. I don't even know what executive function is, to be honest with you, but I do love uh, the, the, t- the topic. But when I was a kid, well, I think I was um, a little, uh, maybe somewhat alone as as a kid. Uh, I had several siblings, older siblings, who had been adopted. And I then uh, my folks thought they wouldn't be able to have children. And then, you know, so they adopted. And then I I came along. And uh, I think they might have kind of resented a little bit me being the natural born child and maybe thought I was getting favoritism, which I, I could well have been. I didn't understand about this, but they were they were a little bit hard on me, I think. So, uh, uh, but, but I had a, uh, uh, my mother's father, uh, my, my grandfather for a while, uh, when I was like in grammar school uh, in Denver, uh, lived in the basement. And uh, he, he kind of befriended me and he taught me how to do somersaults and, and, and he oh. said, Some, someday, you know, th- things will, 
will turn around for you. So I, I, I really appreciated that. And then I had a friend named Vance Ondahl who lived about a block and a half away. And he seemed to me to be incredibly smart and it was always fun and we'd go out looking for ghosts or something like that. And and once we were walking down the street and he said, I have something in my, we, we weren't, we, we were kind of, you know, this was not a well-to-do neighborhood. Uh, and, uh, but uh, he said, I have something in my hand that's, that's worth millions and millions of dollars. And I just couldn't believe it. So what do you, how could you have something in your hand worth, worth that much? And then he, he opened up his hand and said, see, these are seeds like for apple trees and things oh. like that. And you can plant these and you know, you can just grow food for, for generations. And uh, he was very creative. He, he eventually ended up as a science fiction uh, author. Oh, wow. Uh, but, uh, uh, but I did a lot of things, I think kind of m maybe on my own, but I have s certain happy memories of childhood and a vacant lot next door. And there was a vacant lot across the street and we called it Spencer's Forest because it was all overgrown and you could kind of tunnel, oh, wow. tunnel through. It was just the size of a, a lot, but uh, uh, yeah, but I think I was, uh, you know, loved academic things, but but my my interpersonal skills probably weren't quite as as developed. I one of my memories was I this is probably not what you wanted to talk about on the podcast, but I remember in fourth grade, you know, my I think my mother said, you know, are you going to go to a Halloween party? And I, I said I haven't been in, invited to any, and uh, and then she said, well. Why, why don't you have one? And uh, and, and uh, I, I said, yeah, may, maybe I can invite the kids who, who weren't invited to other parties and then we'll wow. have a Halloween party. So I stood up in class and said, if you haven't been invited to a Halloween party, you can come to my Halloween party. And then almost every kid in the class showed up and we had oh the greatest uh, Halloween party. But those are some uh, miscellaneous ramblings from, from childhood. Well, what's so striking about it, and this is something, and I was going to ask you this question, but one thing that stands out for me is your incredible capacity to um, to love people. You know, your compassion is just exudes through your words, your stance. I mean, I don't even see you in the podcast, but I can feel that if I was with you, you would just accept me the way I am. And I think sounds like a lot of seeds. Um, um, you, we, we can hear this in yeah. your stories that you were showing those signs of deep compassion for people. So um, that brings me to this question about um, e emotions and, and maybe you can also um, frame it from your interest in this subject. But you know, I have this uh, a little bit complex <laughs> set of questions, like uh, three questions, but what is the role of emotions in living a full human experience? And um, is it right for us to think that, uh, to group emotions into positive and negative emotions? And um, can there be healthy negative emotions and unhealthy ne negative emotions? And, yeah. Or how should we think about all this? Yeah, well, one way that I think about it is that every, uh, negative emotion has a healthy and an unhealthy version. Oh, I see. Uh, so that uh, uh, I know in chapter three of my first book, Feeling Good, I talked about sadness is not depression, I think was the title of that chapter. Uh, do you have it there? Oh, yeah, there you've got it in your hand. Thanks. And uh, the, uh, you know, I, I talked in that chapter about when an elderly man died. Uh, and when I was a medical student and, uh, and, ha and how his family had gathered around him and asked if he was dying. And I was not a good medical student at all, uh, but uh, I, I remember t telling them that, that uh, yeah, he's, he's not gonna be with you much longer and this is your chance to, to say goodbye. And the tears started rolling down my cheeks because he reminded me actually of my grandfather oh, wow. a little bit. and. Uh, uh, and, and then they all started, you know, crying, and uh, and I went down to the place where the residents met. I was just a medical student, you know, where they do their chart notes, and, and they, you know, cried cried a little bit there. But th that those kinds of tears uh, are, are a beautiful thing, and and I think that was very helpful to that family. 
to, to be encouraged to be emotional because they started crying and stroking his head. He was slipping into a coma, but he could still hear them and uh, they, they got a chance to, to, to say goodbye. But uh, depression is, uh, is a radically different thing. That's kind of the unhealthy uh, version of it because when you're depressed, you're giving yourself distorted messages, telling yourself things that really are not true. Like I'm, I'm worthless and uh, I should be better than I am and I'm, I'm a hopeless case and things will, will never change. And, uh, and, and so in, in general, uh, all of our feelings result from thoughts. An event cannot create emotions in a human being. You have to interpret that event. Think about it in, in a particular way. And so all feelings are, are caused by thoughts but healthy negative feelings are caused by valid thoughts. Like uh, I, I loved him and he was a beautiful man and, and I, I, will, I will miss him and, and you know, he'll, he'll, he'll be gone. And that, that, that grief is a, is a beautiful connection with, with, yeah. with, with life. But unhealthy negative emotions re result from thoughts that are distorted. Depression and anxiety are the world's oldest cons. And those feelings get you out of touch with life and, and you, you, uh, you, you stop functioning effectively and you feel m miserable and they, they rob you of joy. Similarly, with every emotion, there's a healthy and unhealthy version. You know, healthy fear, it keeps us, keeps us alive and we, we want some, some, some fear to keep us alert, to, to avoid the, the uh, you know, the, the pandemic putting, and be careful. Putting ourselves at risk. Yeah, yeah, that, that's right. But unhealthy anxiety, anxiety disorders like obsessive compulsive disorder, panic attacks, uh, generalized, you know, chronic worrying pho phobias are caused by thoughts that, that are not valid. They're, they're distorted and illogical. And we can talk about some of those t ten, 10 distortions. But that, that's I would, true. I would love to. Yeah, that's true of every emotion. Healthy anger is radically different from unhealthy anger. Healthy remorse is radically different from, from neurotic uh, guilt. Uh, uh, and, and so that, that, that's, that's very helpful. And then we probably don't have time to go into this, but positive emotions have a healthy and an unhealthy side too. You see, that healthy, I had never thought about. Yeah. 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 Well, see, interesting po positive training, emotions yeah. cause violence and, and hatred and, uh, uh, war and, 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 and murder, uh, the, the, the distortions like, oh, we're better than they are. Like uh, righteousness? Yeah, yeah, like I'm, we're morally superior and those people, are, they probably smell a lot and, and they're, they don't look very intelligent and our religion is better than theirs. And, 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 and so one unhealthy positive emotion is that kind of moral superiority that, superiority that leads, to, leads to racial hatred and, and, and religious hatred. And then also happiness is not the same as mania. Uh, you know, mm. mania is, is a severe uh, illness, a, a psychotic thing from bipolar manic depressive illness and but pure joy enlightenment f f a sense of ecstasy that, that yeah. that's that's a healthy thing so that's the quick overview on my view and interpretation at least of healthy versus unhealthy feelings thank you so i had a, a question as you were speaking that if emotions all emotions are thoughts um, I guess the foundation of the CBT, cognitive behavior therapy, or any intervention we offer is, is rooted in this idea that you can guide and direct your thoughts. Is that a good way to think about it? No, not really. Uh, no? Guiding and directing negative thoughts is not one of, I've, I've, I've developed or learned more than 200 techniques to help people who are depressed and anxious and using the old cognitive therapy and the new team therapy I've developed in the last 10, 15 years at, at Stanford, we can now see re really rapid changes in, in people, sometimes recovery in just a single two hour therapy session to complete a course of therapy now. But the, the, the techniques are, are much more sophisticated than you, gu guiding and directing your thoughts. That would not be helpful to someone who's having a panic attack or someone who's suicidal or, 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 or something like that. But I can give you some great examples so you can see how, how the new techniques as well as the older techniques work to, to because the, the very moment you stop believing a negative thought in that instant, your feelings will, will change. I yeah, see. But, yeah, but, yes. but, but you need 
pretty powerful techniques to, to help someone most of the time change these distorted negative thoughts because they've often been thinking that way for years, thinking I'm no good, uh, I'm a loser, I'm a failure, uh, I'm not a real man, as a fellow was telling me uh, re re recently, and uh, I, I'm a weirdo, and uh, p people just be beat up on themselves uh, uh, terribly, and and you need you know really really powerful, uh, pretty amazing techniques to to get uh, help somebody get, let let go of that of that that mind mindset. What, one of the problems is when you give yourself these negative messages, say I'm I'm a loser, I'm I'm a failure, I'm hopeless. You feel worthless you feel hopeless. And then you say, well, gosh, I feel so hopeless. I must be hopeless. De oh, depression well, yeah. and anxiety, those are, it's a total body experience. And, and you're just absolutely certain that these distorted thoughts are, are valid when, when, when they're not. So, you know, one of the thing, striking things that uh, when I attended your um, um, training, uh, that uh, that you mentioned uh, now. Which that one did you do? Piece. Which which one did you attend? I did uh, three weeks ago. Uh, I did oh, the Jill? cognitive distortions work. Yes. Oh, isn't she amazing? Oh, Jill with Levitt? you, yes, yes. Yeah. She, with Jill, it was she was amazing. Yeah. Of course, I I little. Uh, it was a sa Sunday workshop, um, and it was a full day workshop, and I misunderstood the four thirty p.m. ending to be Eastern Standard Time, it was actually oh. Pacific Standard Time. So my family got a little worried. They're like, you have not stepped out of your room. What's going on on Sunday? Yeah, right. <laughs> because I told yeah. them I'll be done, but then it went beyond that 4.30. I'm, but so, I'm so glad you heard that. And if any <laughs> listeners are interested on my website, feelinggood.com, there's a resources page with with workshops. There, there, There's not a lot of them these days, but if you look there from time to time, Jill and I are going to do one on depression in October. and. From time to time, I do you know virtual uh, things. But we taught last night at Stanford. Uh, Jill and I did. We had oh, you did. We had forty mental because what health was professionals so, there. I'm and so glad you went virtual because yeah. we can now access you more readily. Well, because when you came to Atlanta to a couple of uh, like uh, no in November or December, I yeah. I was traveling and I couldn't attend. So oh, yeah. that was a real great treat. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so what you mentioned there that like this, um, the impact of the actual thought changes is now measurable in, in the body changes and vice yeah. versa. Right. So uh, b before you get into these 10 distortions, can you just tell us a little bit about uh, how young does one begin to develop uh, uh, distortions, cognitive distortions? And do, do, do we need to have a diagnosable disability or challenge or disorder? Or is it a normal phenomenon to have distortions when you are filtering world through personal lens? I think it's a normal phenomenon. I, I, I'm not sure it's productive. Like the American Psychiatric Association has like three or 700 mental disorders in their yes. diagnostic and st statistical manual, but most of them aren't disorders. It's just most people feel shy and socially anxious. And then what they're trying to say is if that's severe, you have something called social anxiety disorder, but there's no such mm -hmm. thing as social anxiety disorder. Uh, uh, there's no such thing as generalized anxiety disorder but they make up these criteria so they can give pills and, and diagnose you oh, with wow. like a mental mental d disorder. We, we all worry, and, but then the, the way they have it set up, if you worry about two or more things, more days than not for six months, then you have generalized anxiety disorder. So that mm -hmm. means at midnight on the sixth month, the day that's the sixth month, <laughs> you develop a brain disorder you didn't have an hour earlier. It's just nonsensical. Like worrying is something that human beings do. We all worry at times, and uh, but it's not a brain d disorder. It's easily treatable. You can, uh, if if it's getting in your way, uh, tons of techniques to to cause that worrying to disappear and quickly. But uh, thinking about these things as as mental disorders is is not not very effective. That's my phone ringing. I'll just just unplug it there, so we're not. You know, the, the, if I can say one more thing about uh, having done with, uh, in a clinical work in, for 20 years uh, in, as a speech language pathologist, I see developmental delays, uh, you know, diagnosed disabilities such as ADHD, Asperger's, 
other oh, yeah. sort of spectrum disorder. And they all have this underlying uh, difficulty in managing uh, their own capacities to be a productive person, whether it's oh, in the social context yeah. or in an academic context. But then to me, it is completely possible to become anxious when you know you are not effective. And, you know, yeah. uh, or it's completely possible to feel ashamed of yourself when you know you're smart, but you're still doing beginner's uh, math when your friends have moved on to calculus because they're more organized and they're turning their homework in. So sometimes I feel uh, the, the, the complaints or the disorders that get labeled on top of that are result from not learning how to manage uh, their own thinking, feelings, and, and their uh, relationship to their work. Sure, I think it starts as a child. And, and what you just mentioned is one of the, the, the two most common reasons people get depressed and anxious is, you know, I'm not good enough, I'm not smart enough is, is one, or I have this difficulty, therefore, uh, you know, I'm, I'm inferior as a human being, uh, or, or I'm not lovable. Uh, is another is another common one, and I think the these things st start in childhood, and and you get the the like. By the way, I had a speech pathology problem too, as I Did just you? remembered as a child. Yeah, I they they sent me to speech pathology because I couldn't pronounce my R's. Oh, you, well, that got treated, but that could have been just developmental achievement. <laughs> yeah, right, right. <laughs> but, oh yeah, my goodness, it was, it was fun. I went to this speech articulation pathology. therapy. Yes. Yeah. But uh, so, yeah, um, and, uh, yeah, I think it starts uh, in, in, in childhood and you pick it up from your parents too, because, you know, most people have these systems of belief that give rise to depression and anxiety where you're basing your self-esteem on how popular you are, how attractive you are, how successful you are. That, that, and, and part of the recovery from depression is, is to, to change your value system. Yes. So you, you, uh, you're you're not trying to become special. You're not trying to rate yourself as 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 a human, mm. as a human being. Real recovery is not only changing these distorted thoughts, but changing your value system at at, at a deeper level, and uh, which can have profound, long-lasting results. You see, because you can be otherwise therapist dependent. Make me feel good. If that's the approach to therapy, then you need your therapist for a lifetime. And that's not what you're all about. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, that kind of irritates me, too. Ever since I was a psychiatric resident, I, I started fantasizing. I wonder if really rapid recovery would be even theoretically possible. And, and I used to fantasize about it. And now, it, now it's a reality. I've spent my life try, trying to do that. But I thought the first thing we'd have to do is start measuring things. So you could see how much change there was in a therapy session from the start to the end of each session. Now we do that all the time because without that information, the therapist skills can't grow. And when I was a resident, it was all about you just sit around with people and to get them to express their feelings. And you're not supposed to say much as a therapist. And then something good is supposed to come out of that. And in my experience, nothing good ever came out of it. The patients would come and cry and sob and say they're worthless and their marriage is falling apart and I'm not helping them. And, and my, my supervisors who were psychoanalysts said, just tell them, say, tell, tell me more. And they said, you can move your hands like this. That means tell me more. Because <laughs> they said, you should only say, tell me more twice in the session. What? So if you've run out of your two tell me mores, then you, you jiggle He's your hands. Doing. And my patient said, oh, you, you never help me. And, and you, you jiggle your hands. And then I jiggle my hands because I'd used up my two tell me mores. And then I would ask my super, and then the supervisor said, oh, this is such a great <laughs> session. Your patient was sobbing and angry all the session long. You're getting out all this repressed anger. And then I would say, but when do they recover? Will this help them? And they would never answer that question. Oh, and I goodness. never saw any of my patients re recover. It just, there's this endless venting and, and talking. And I said, there, there's got to be a, a better way. So I know we, we have to cover these 10 patterns. Do you mind then before that uh, talking up to us about what it constitutes CBT, cognitive behavior therapy, that you are referring to, which is effective way of sure. transforming uh, the yeah. patient? Yeah. Yeah, cognitive therapy is what I wrote about in my book, Feeling Good, the new mood therapy. And it has to do with the idea that goes back to the Greek philosopher Epictetus that we're disturbed not by the events of our lives, but 
by the thoughts that, that we have uh, about them. And the okay. second idea uh, is that the thoughts when you're depressed and anxious are distorted. Uh, depression and anxiety are cons. You're conning yourself, but you don't realize it. And the third idea is the moment you stop believing those negative thoughts in that very instant, your emotions will change and, and you'll recover. And when I wrote that book, there was only maybe probably 10 or 15 cognitive therapists in the world. It had been developed by uh, Albert Ellis in New York and Aaron Beck at, at Penn. Hmm. And most people thought we were, we were quacks and because they were so committed and many still are to this endless talking uh, kind, of, uh, kind of therapy. But uh, that book started out slow, but it's, it's old now over 5 million copies. It's still number one on the Amazon bestseller list. In fact, it has three of the top five positions on the, uh, in the depression category. And one of the reasons it's sold so much is because uh, research studies of, on the book itself showed that 50 to 65% of people who were depressed, if you just give them a copy of that book, they'll be recovered in four weeks without treatment. And that's why it has, has, has caught on. And now cognitive therapy has become the most popular form of therapy in the world and, and the most researched form of therapy ever developed. And, but the new thing I've done at Stanford I, I still use all those powerful cognitive therapy techniques, but now we have new techniques to melt away resistance to change. And that, mm. that's, that's as powerful as the cognitive therapy techniques were. And so the new package has cognitive therapy plus these new uh, resistance busting or resistance melting techniques. And that's why we can get so much faster recovery now. So tell, tell our listeners a little bit about the, the resistance, what you're referring to, because it's interesting, uh, and, and this has always been the case, at least in my work, that uh, uh, people bring their children or adults come, or college kids come to me, and then they want change, but they don't want to do the work. And, and so, for example, I'm disorganized, I procrastinate, and then these are the steps you need to take. And then I always find that they, they are like, eh, I don't have a buy-in into this, or I don't like it. So, so this technique, that the team technique, um, if you can tell us a little bit about that psychological underpinning of resistance, and then why you conceptualize this added portion or, um, you know, leveling up that uh, cognitive therapy, that'd be yeah. great. Yeah, well, there's eight forms of resistance two forms for depression, two forms for anxiety, two forms mm -hmm. for relationship problems, and two forms for habit and, and addictions. And for, for depression, uh, the, there's something, and that, it's called outcome resistance and process resistance. Outcome resistance means you, you say you want a good outcome, you want to get over your depression, but there, there's a part of you that clings to the depression and fights uh, against change. Uh, the mm. same is true in anxiety. You, you want to get over your anxiety, but a part of you fights against letting go of the anxiety. That's called outcome re resistance. Process resistance means you might want to get over your depression or anxiety, but you don't want to do, do the work. Like to make it real obvious with anxiety, outcome resistance, so let's say someone's having panic attacks or performance ang anxiety, uh, or, or whatever, they, they want to get over their anxiety, but at the same time, they think something terrible will happen if they get over their anxiety. They think their anxiety is, is protecting them from, from some mm. awful thing. Like a woman I treated uh, with obsessive compulsive disorder uh, was washing her hands 50, 50 times a day, and she wanted treatment. Okay, fine, but suppose I, we, we press this magic button and you'll be cured, so you'll stop washing your hands 50 times a day, you'll wash them maybe twice or, you know, some average normal minimal number of hand washings. Uh, wh what do you think would happen then? She said, oh, well, then my hands will get contaminated. Okay, and uh, let's, let's assume your hands get contaminated. What then? And she says, well, then I'll touch my children. Okay, mm -hmm. and then what are you afraid of? Well, then they'll get contaminated. Uh -huh. And then what's going to happen? Then they'll get leukemia and die. I said, okay, so you want to press this magic button and then have your children get leukemia and die. Is that what you're telling me? Do you see this? She said, oh, no. So that's the <laughs> outcome resistance. You've got to bring that to conscious awareness that on the I one see. hand, a person wants help, but there are these powerful forces 
keep keeping them that, that keeping them them stuck and the same with depression most depressed people are saying i'm not good enough and they beat up on themselves uh, re relentlessly do, do you see and say so, okay well if you press this magic button you'll be cured in today's session and you'll go out in a state of euphoria do you want that and they say oh yeah i'll press that magic button and then I say, okay, but you're telling me you've got all this fault and you're not good at this and you're not good at that and you're kind of a mediocre human being. And if you press this magic button, nothing will change except for your mood. You'll, you'll be a euphoric mediocre human being. Is that what you want? You say, oh no, I don't want to press that magic button. Because you see the resistance comes from what's beautiful and most beautiful and awesome about a person. And you have to deal with that first or they'll yes but you and fight you when, when, you, mm. when you try to help them change. And so that's been the huge breakthrough is we've, I've developed uh, pretty powerful new techniques. So clever, it, yes. It, it, it just, it, it makes sense. And then once you get rid of that resistance, people work with you and they, they recover, uh, you know, with incredible uh, speed, often in just 10 or 15 minutes once that resistance is gone. Whereas in the old days, I used to fight with people about their distorted thoughts. Now I don't have to do that anymore because we can totally antidote people's resistance really quickly now. But that, that's just the tip of the iceberg. There's a lot more to it. I know we have to get to the distortions. Yes, that, so let's talk about distortions. And here's what I'm going to say to the audience member. Uh, Dr. Burns' website is so in-depth. His work and, and what's so fascinating and uh, your generosity, you know, you have shared this information again and again and again in various forms, simplified ways. You bring experts and or you banter, you model. So that has been really helpful because some of these, I will tell from my personal experience, this was my uh, second workshop, but I had already heard 100 episodes. I had read all your book. But when you, it comes to applying as a clinician, for example, or even in if, whatever capacity you're serving in helping people, that practice needs a lot of roots. You know, you need lots of yeah. practice to, yeah. to become proficient, uh, to recognize even signs of what, how people are behaving. Um, yeah. But I do think that that can have incredible impact on your interpersonal relationships in all aspects of life, which is so exciting. So let's start with the first uh, cognitive. So you described 10 most common uh, cognitive distortions. And first one is all or nothing. Uh, yeah, that, that's where you look thinking. at things. Yeah, you look at things in black and white uh, categories. If I'm not a complete success, uh, I'm a total failure. And this you see with almost mm -hmm. all people who are depressed and most people who are anxious. And you see it in relationship uh, problem problems as, as well. I, uh, when I was a psychiatric resident, uh, Dr. Beck, who was one of the founders of cognitive therapy, criticized the way I had handled a patient who was behind in his payments at the clinic. And uh, mm. I instantly felt devastated. And I had the thought, my gosh, I'm, I have, they're gonna take my medical license away. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm a failure. I, I have no aptitude for, for psychotherapy. It, it was the all or nothing thinking. You see, because I made a mistake, I, I was seeing myself as a total total failure. And, uh, and it seemed very real to, to me. And I went home at night and, and, and thought, well, gosh, this is when that silly endorphin theory was, was around, this uh, wrong-headed belief that somehow you have to boost your endorphins through exercise. So I ran out, I ran six miles on a very steep, hilly course at pretty high speed. And, and, I, and the farther I ran, the more worthless I felt. It didn't do me any good whatsoever. Never has running. I've never had that runner's high, never even once. And it, I just thought, my gosh, took me so long to realize what a failure I was. And then I said, well, write down your thoughts on a piece of paper. Maybe they're distorted. That's what you tell your patients to do. And they said, ah, I don't want to do that. My thoughts are real. I know that I'm a failure. And I told yourself, mm. now you're whining like your patients whine. Write them down on a piece of paper and, and say, hey, look at what you're telling yourself. So I wrote it down and said, I'm a terrible therapist. I'm a failure as a human being. I'm going to lose my medical license. And I looked at that and I said, these thoughts are preposterous. It's, it's just black and white thinking. And I said, why don't I tell myself instead, I'm a beginner. I have the right to make mistakes and, and I can correct them and learn and, and grow. And uh, tomorrow I'm going to see this patient again and I can tell him I screwed up 
and tell me he probably feels hurt and angry and we can talk it over and, that, and my depression instantly vanished. And then I saw the patient wow. the next morning, I said, I, feel, I owe you an apology. I, I'm so ashamed because I really like you and I screwed up in our last session and t tell me what that was like. We just had the best session ever. He just gave me the highest possible uh, rating, but that's a perfect example of, of all or nothing thinking. And yet, from the point of view of resistance, a lot of people who are into all or nothing thinking are perfectionists, and they mm -hmm. won't want to give it up because they, they think with some truth that their perfectionism drives them to achieve more. So that's why with the new oh, approach yes. I've developed, we, we work also with motivation and, and distortion simultaneously. Wow, so it sounds to me it's like a self-flogging to propel yourself into yeah. motion, which is completely yeah. defeating. Yeah. Because it won't take you for long distance, right? Yeah, um, yeah. But they, you do get some short-term gains out of it. You know, I used to tell myself, I, I have to be able to help every single patient. Other therapists shouldn't try because they're not that good. But I have to try because I should be that good. You know, and it did help in a way because I created dozens of new psychotherapy techniques. When I was stuck with patients, I'd start creating more and more techniques, figuring out why I'm stuck. And it did allow me to, to, to develop psychotherapy techniques, but it was at great, at great cost because life became like a roller coaster. When I thought I was doing well, I would get euphoric. And then when a patient said, you're not helping, it, it was so painful to, to, to me until I finally learned to let go of my perfectionism. And then when patients said, you're not helping me, I started saying, you know, I agree totally. And it's sad because I really like you. Tell me how I'm screwing up. You're probably angry and hurt. I want to hear about this. And then all of a sudden, the heavens opened up and patients I'd been stuck with started, started to re recover. But it's, it's, it's not easy uh, for people to let go of that, that perfectionism and, and all or nothing thinking. And you know, in the in 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 with exec with respect to executive function, there are three uh, pillars uh, that support uh, the framework of executive function. One is inhibition or impulse control. Second is working memory, and third is mental flexibility, affective and cognitive flexibility. So that being able to take a perspective of the other, as well as be able to think from many pr points of views, to have a a, a way of thinking creatively or even uh, just uh, uh, getting out of that black and white thinking. And I, I find that a lot of my uh, uh, interactions with those who are struggling, uh, struggle a lot with the, this mental flexibility. They just don't, they don't have this ability to separate self from self and take a perspective on self from somewhere, someone else's point of view. So this particular, um, I think, cognitive distortion really speaks to me. I'm, of course, uh, subjected to that myself many times. Sure. Uh, but but I, I really like us to be aware of that, as you're saying, because, um, and one technique I think you already mentioned, uh, which I have not tried so prolifically, but write it down is what you're saying, and look mm -hmm. at yourself, which is a, creating that perspective. Yeah, uh, I think it's, this, go yeah. ahead. Yeah, oh, great. we'll go on to overgeneralization. Yeah, uh, I was going to say it's probably impossible to change your thinking without writing the thoughts down. And patients- Really? Some, Tell yeah. us about that. Well, be, because- What does it do? On a mental level, your thoughts feed each other and, yeah. and they create negative emotions. So you think the thoughts are valid. When you write mm -hmm. them down with short sentences and number them, then you can examine them one at a time and look at my list of 10 cognitive distortions. And you can say, oh, this is all or nothing thinking. This is an overgeneralization. This is a hidden should statement. And then you can start to attack them one at a time. And in my clinical practice, I finally got to the point where if, if patients said they didn't want to do the homework, they didn't want to do the written exercises, I, I refused treatment and said, I, I refer you to pe people in the community who love to sit and talk endlessly. But I, I, I've never had a patient who recovered with that kind of therapy. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not trying to get rid of you. But you should know that if you want to work with me, the written homework is, is mandatory. It's not negotiable. That, that's great. So, yes, that does bring us to overgeneralization. Uh, how would you describe that? Overgeneralization is when you see a negative event as a never ending pattern of defeat. So uh, a young woman uh, broke up with her boyfriend of, of two years and uh, then she, she got upset and, and, and said, I, I, 
I, I, I'm telling myself I'm unlovable. I'll be alone forever. As you see, so she's taking relationships break up all the time for, for everybody. And, but she's saying, well, because this broke up, then I am unlovable. She's generalizing to herself. Do you see, she oh, wow. thinks she has an yes. effective self and she's generalizing to the future. And overgeneralization, you can tell because there's usually, uh, you know, a label you're attaching to yourself. I am a failure or, or mm -hmm. you're using words like always or, or, or never. The, this is always happening to me. I'll, I'll never be, be loved, that, that, that type of thing. And so this is kind of, again, get, uh, a, a anecdote, an antidote to this is I am not my thoughts. I am separate from my thoughts. Like, so she's saying, no, 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 I, I have I a failure, say, then I'm a failure. Yeah, well, yeah, that's, that's, what, what, that, that's what she's doing. But there are no simple antidotes. I have, you know, over a hundred techniques I, I, I've developed. Yes, you have yes. to work with the motivation. It's not a formula where you can, here's a formula for, for that. We're teach, we're treating uh, hu human beings. But yes, but, yes, but yes. yes uh, you, you, yeah, on some level, you see, we, there is no such thing as a self. Humans don't have a self. That's just a kind of a mythical construct. But all suffering, 100% of depression comes from thinking you have a self that's inferior or, or defective. But that insight is after you recover, you see that. J just saying that to people it tends not to be help helpful to them. You have to show them how to crush the, what they're telling themselves, crush that, those, those distorted thoughts. And you know, this part, particularly the way you explained, uh, to me sounds like that, uh, in, at least in Hindu and Buddhist uh, principle, the self-actualization process. Uh, to kind of really discovering the truth that you are not this or that. Uh, yeah, yeah. Right? Yeah, and, yeah, yeah, right. And, and, and really not, again, I, I, and also another thing I, um, that I have uh, heard you talk about this as well, but that witnessing that the innocence when you bring, that innocence basically has no judgment attached to it. So yeah. you observe yourself doing all these things, experiencing all these things, and you allow them to be. And I'm yeah. simplifying this too much, but uh, is that a fair way to think about it? Yeah, also? That's, that, 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 that's right. I, I sometimes say a human is like a river. A river has no particular shape. We have yes. no particular self. And I we love have that. So many things that, that we can do uh, and attaching an, uh, an identity, thinking you have an identity or a self is just put you, uh, put you in a box. I can remember at one point in, in my career, when I was little, the one thing I was good at was ping pong. <laughs> and, uh, and then at one point in my career, uh, you know, and I always had the fantasy, if I could only have had coaching, I could have been a tremendous table tennis player. And because uh, I wasn't <laughs> very good at anything else athletically. And so at one point, uh, I, I said to myself, I realized when I was jogging, you know, I'm not a psychiatrist. I have the training of a psychiatrist. I have the degree. I'm certified by the National Board of Neurology and Psychiatry, but I'm not a psychiatrist. There's no such thing as a psychiatrist. Oh, wow. See, I'm just a person who's doing psychiatry, among other things. I and love so that. I, you liberated yourself. Yes. I said, I don't have to even be doing this anymore if I don't want. I said, I've, I've, I think I've always wanted to become an Olympic table tennis player. So I gave up psychiatry for, for a time. And oh, did I, you? Yes, uh, for about a, about a year. And, and you actually tried table tennis? Yes, I hired a coach. Uh, he was the uh, Caribbean That's champion. His That's His name really... is Ernie. He called himself the Black Pearl of the Caribbean. He was a top world uh, table tennis player. And I hired him. He had moved to Philadelphia. He was very poor. So he gave me a good deal. And I hired him for 20 hours a week of table tennis training. And we set up an Olympic table in my garage. We had a TV going, we had a ball machine. And he, uh, it would be four intense hours a day of just pounding the ball and shouting when you hit it and learning all, all these, these things. And, uh, and it was just so much, it was really, really fun. Uh, and after about six months of this, I talked myself and my son into getting into this Olympic training program in Bethesda, Maryland for table tennis players. And we oh got goodness. into this four-day table tennis camp. And 
and we thought they were going to be the U.S. Olympic team, but they were the ch little children. It was a camp for little children. Oh my goodness! And it was so embarrassing. And uh, they matched me against this 11-year-old boy, and I had uh, all this training I'd been doing. I thought I was some really hot shot table tennis player, and I was going to crush this little boy. And he beat me 21 to zero, five games no. in a row. <laughs> <laughs> that is hilarious no you did yeah. not do that <laughs> oh it turned out he was one of the highest ranked players in the united states when he was only 11 he just killed it every time he hit the ball so i decided i think i better go back to psychiatry and something i'm a little better at but it was a fun adventure you know and and uh, not realizing i didn't have a self or an identity uh, g g g gave me gave me freedom really to to do something fun oh my goodness what a great adventurous way to experiment with <laughs> with life giving choices and creating some <laughs> yeah <laughs> i love that story well that i think um we are coming to the end so i want to do two more distortions if possible sure okay and then well, we do the quick version yes please or maybe you can do a quick version of uh, all of them let's see let's oh, yeah we can do that just a quick version of all i'll, let's I'll do just that. Run, run through them the next one is a, a metal filter that's when you're depressed you you just focus on all the negatives about yourself and then you think you're a, a total loser you filter out anything that's positive and mm -hmm. that goes on automatically with depression it goes on with anxiety and, and with anger too you when you're angry you filter out anything good about the person that you're you're annoyed with discounting the positive is uh, like uh, saying that the good things don't even count. Oh, wow. uh, yes. you, you know, someone compliments you and you say, oh, they're just saying that to be nice. They didn't really mean it. Um, the uh, jumping to conclusions is where you jump to conclusions that aren't warranted by, by the facts. And there's two common forms, mind reading and fortune telling. Fortune telling is when you tell yourself something terrible is about to happen. And that, that is always the cause of anxiety. When I get on that plane, I just know it'll run into turbulence and crash, for example. Or fortune telling causes hopelessness when you're depressed. You, you predict that you'll be depressed forever. And you believe that and you feel mm -hmm. hopeless, uh, but it's always a, a distortion. It's, it's never valid. And then mind reading is when you think you know how others are are, are, are feeling about you, uh, and you may may think that uh, they're they're being very uh, critical of you or judgmental when when they're not. The social anxiety results from uh, mind reading. You get into a, a, a party and you say, "I'm the only one who feels anxious." People wouldn't be interested in mm. what I have to say. Uh, you know, think, things of that nature. Uh, then so there's that's number four. So. That, well, that's five. We've done uh, the five. Yes, jumping yeah. to conclusion. Yes. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, right. And then number six would be uh, magnification and minimization, where you blow things out of proportion. You see this in panic attacks. People get anxious, and then they say, "Oh, I'm about to go crazy," or "I'm about to have a heart attack," and they really believe that, and then they panic for about uh, twenty minutes, and then the panic attack uh, d d disappears. Um, the next one would be emotional reasoning. We mentioned that earlier. Uh, that's a term I coined when I created the list of 10 distortions for my book, Feeling Good. Emotional reasoning is reasoning from how you feel. I feel like I feel worthless, so I must be a loser. I it's feel like hopeless. A reverse, yeah, going in the reverse direction. Yeah, and, and, and that's a distortion because your thoughts create your emotions and your emotions are, are often no more realistic than those curved mirrors in an, in an amusement park. So if distorted thoughts create the emotions and the emotions you have uh, may not be reflecting reality. Then we've got uh, should st well, labeling, that's where you, that's like overgeneralization where you say, I'm a bad father, I'm a bad, husband or wife or I'm a loser, I'm a failure. And then you can label other people. You can say he is a jerk, uh, that, that mm. type of thing. And then you've got should statements. That, that, that's 
uh, number nine. Yeah. yeah, I, I, I shouldn't be so screwed up. I shouldn't have made that mistake. I should be better than I am. Those are self-directed shoulds that cause guilt and shame and depression. And then other directed shoulds. You shouldn't be that way. You've got no right to say that. You shouldn't feel that way. You shouldn't say that. You shouldn't believe that. You shouldn't support Trump. You shouldn't be against Trump. You know, all these shoulds that we direct at others. Wow. And that creates rage and anger or in traffic, you know, that person shouldn't drive in front of me. And then you go into a road rage type of thing. And then the last two are self-blame uh, and other blame. The two forms of blame, self-blame is you, you're, you're beating up on yourself and blaming yourself and putting yourself down. And other blame, you think someone you're in conflict with is, is the entire cause of the problem. And you're not looking at your own mm. role and in, in, in the way you interact with that, that person and are probably you're actually contributing to or and triggering the other person. Wow. Well, thank you for doing a, a, yeah. a great overview. You know what's a, a remarkably uh, assuring about this is one is this, this abstract notion that uh, I'm not feeling good or I'm feeling depressed or I'm feeling stressed. But now once you at least create some framework and organize them or they can be categorized. So your entire treatment can be also directed in that. It gives me so much assurance that we're not crazy. Like these are all understandable processes that are happening to us. And the yeah. second, right? Yeah, but more than that, they, they, the, the negative, your negative feelings result from and negative thoughts from the part of you that's most beautiful and awesome. We didn't go too deeply in, into that, but it, you're, you're depressed and anxious and angry not because you have a mental disorder or a chemical imbalance in your brain, but these are expressions of your core values and, and uh, the, the things that are about you that are most beautiful and awesome. And there also there's many benefits to all of your uh, negative uh, thoughts and feelings. And the moment you see this, I try to sell my patients on continue with your negative feelings, continue with your negative thoughts. They're showing beautiful things about you. And if I can really sell you on, on not giving up your negative thoughts and feelings, your resistance paradoxically will disappear and recovery will just be a stone's throw away. Wow. Well, thank you so much for uh, walking us through this, giving us hope, and most importantly, giving us very specific techniques because this is what had, had been missing before your work came on board. As you said, this laying down on a couch and, and the traditional view of therapy is ongoing talking and dumping your thoughts outward, which is one more way to continue to stay thinking about your emotions or creating more emotions by thinking. Yes, so, all you do when you do that, you practice the brain circuits yes. that cause the depression. So you're actually training yourself to be more depressed. So. So with that, uh, um, so all right, listeners, that's all the time we have for today. As you can see, these are important conversations uh, we are having with knowledgeable, incredibly qualified and passionate experts with unique perspective. And this particularly pers perspective Dr. Burns brought us helps us think about executive function and management because every individual we are working with has these responses. And particularly if you have roadblocks in your own capacity to facilitate success, then you're going to have some major work to do ahead of you. So, and as we end this uh, podcast, I have a request for you. There are three asks. If you love what you're hearing, do share it with the, share this episode with your friends and colleagues and uh, loved ones. Uh, secondly, if you have a moment, please take, uh, take the time to give us a review. And finally, be sure to subscribe to the uh, full prefrontal uh, podcast, uh, as well as the newsletter. So I really look forward to seeing you all again uh, during our next episode next week. And meanwhile, uh, let me thank Dr. David Burns once again for being here and being fabulous. Thanks so much. I just <laughs> loved uh, talking to you and shooting the breeze and I wish everyone the very best. Thank you very much. Have a great one. You too. Bye-bye. Thank you for listening to Full Prefrontal, exposing the mysteries of executive function. To contact your host, Sucheta Kamath, and learn more about her work on improving executive function, visit her website at exqinfinitenowhow.com. That's www.exqinfinitenowhow.com. Tune in next week for another informative episode of Full Prefrontal, hosted by the founder of EXQ, Sucheta Kamath.